Good afternoon and welcome to the final session actually for the 2020 Family Business Summit um, this afternoon. I am delighted to be joined by Josh Barron from Banyan Global in the States. Um, Josh has been working with family firms all over the world um, for many years now and will share a little bit about his journey into, into family business consulting. He also writes prolifically and contributes a lot to the magazines and platforms such as Harvard Business Review. So well, we've probably saved one of the best to last. So hopefully um, the speakers out there, the, the attendees out there will gain some insights into some of the keys to multi-generational family business success. So Josh, without further ado, let me hand the, the platform to you. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Josh now and anyone that has any questions, please post them through the chat box and I can make sure they're addressed with Josh uh, before the end of the session. So enjoy the session. Um, Josh, the floor's all yours. Great. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the summit. I'm a big fan of the work that you're doing to help connect family businesses in, in the UK and now uh, all over the world. So um, thanks very much for, for this opportunity. Um, and uh, before I jump in, just uh, quickly on my own background, um, like a lot of people who have found their way into this world of family businesses, um, I, I really did so mostly by accident and good fortune. I didn't know that this was a career that people advise family businesses for a living until I found it. Um, almost 13 years ago. I'm a, um, a strategy consultant by background, first at Bain and & Company and then a spinoff of Bain uh, that works with large foundations and nonprofit organizations. And I just got connected to, um, to one of my current colleagues uh, who I was introduced to and said, you should try this. And um, I've been doing it ever since and, and now can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, it's um, just an incredibly rewarding um, opportunity to get to work with, um, with family businesses all over the world. And as Paul mentioned, I also uh, teach at Columbia Business School, classes in uh, family business management um, and managing conflict in family business. Uh, Paul mentioned a few of my students might have signed up to join. So the, the tables are turned if you all are out there and have any, have any questions. Um, so what I would like to do today is to talk about this idea of the keys to multi-generational success in a family business. Paul, still okay to see the presentation? Yeah, that's perfect, Josh. Okay, great. Um, and this is actually, a, it's an interesting time to be talking about long-term, uh, long-term anything. I, I sort of think a lot, like a lot of us, you know, I'm finding it hard to really focus as much on the long-term, uh, but beca because of all the, this sort of disruption that we're, that we're all dealing with to our businesses, to our lives, to everything around us. Um, Paul and I were just talking, it's, it's certainly brought not only bad things, but certainly a lot of new things and changes. And, um, so one of the things that I'll, I'll do is actually to share, you know, not just the sort of what's going on over the, the long term, but how company family businesses are, are sort of navigating through these short term dynamics. And that kind of brings me to my first thing I want to just mention is this. This is a quote that uh, came from uh, a, a successful family business owner uh, that, I, that I know and respect. Um, and he basically described their family philosophy as first survive. Uh, next profit, then grow, uh, which is interesting because if you if you sort of work in the tech world or Silicon Valley, it's almost exactly backwards. Uh, you try to grow first, maybe create profitability. Um, if that company doesn't work, you go on to the next one. And um, that's actually not at all how most family businesses operate. It's, it's a recognition that if you want to make it into the future, you first have to survive the present. Um, and you have to do that in a way that is mostly internally generating, not relying on external markets. And, um, and so this, that first part, you know, that survival part, I think has been hard uh, for a lot of family businesses right now. And um, as, as this was all heating up back in March when the world was so uncertain, we actually launched a, a survey to try to figure out um, what's going on, how family businesses are, are responding uh, to all of this kind of uh, disruption and change. And, and you can, if you're, anyone's interested, you can find on our website both the uh, this response sort of summary to the survey, we had almost 200 respondents to it. And then we, a colleague and I wrote, wrote an article for HBR kind of pulling the same, some of those insights about how do you kind of navigate, navigate this present, uh, this present circumstances. So as I said, during this, during this talk, I'm gonna weave together um, sort of a long-term view as well as some of the shorter term implications of kind of how do you, how do you manage, how do you think about surviving um, and thr even thriving during this, during this pandemic. So just to, just to start out with how, sort of how, is, how are family businesses doing? Um, and um, I think not surprisingly, probably to those of you that are in a family business or, or advising them, um, um, it's been tough. Um, in, our, in the survey, people that responded to our survey 
um, almost 90% you know, saw a negative impact. So, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a problem. Um, I think this, uh, part of the silver lining is that for most, at least so far, and this you know, data is a couple, couple months old, we're gonna relaunch the survey here in a couple weeks to sort of get another check on how things are doing. Um, it hasn't been existential. So if you look at that, the 5% feel like they're in a danger of failing, um, but most are suffering in some significant way. Of course, you have a few that are seeing a, a positive impact. Um, you know, we work with a, a family that owns a canned good business, and this has never been a better time um, in terms of sales than, than this period. Uh, but for most, it's been a really, a really challenging time. And, and so it's important to kind of keep that in mind as we're, as we're thinking about the long term. Um, this sort of interest in the in sort of the perspective that I'm going to share with you about what it takes to be successful is one that a colleague and I uh, um, have captured in a book that we've written for for Harvard Business Review, um, scheduled to come out January 26th. Um, you can pre-order it now on, on Amazon and so on, but you'll get a sneak preview of it um, um, over the next half hour or so as we're as we're talking through it. And the the core idea of of the book and really of the work that myself and, and my colleagues have been doing. Um, with family businesses around the world um, is on this idea of the family as owners, on the importance of ownership to the long-term success of a, of a family business. And really when I joined this field, you know, almost 15 years ago at this point, um, there was a lot of focus on, on a really important, what it, I think was at the time a breakthrough idea about the importance of taking the family part of the family business seriously. And that sounds really obvious at this point, but this was something that wasn't really looked at very much. If you look back into even as late as the you know, 80s and 90s, people really weren't focusing on the, the family aspect of the importance of, of organizing and aligning the business family to make a family business successful and how that was different than any other kind of business. And um, I, I think that's fair to call that a breakthrough insight. And that led to a lot of things that you in my travels, you know, all around the world, working with family businesses, things that people have, have become commonplace, things like family councils, family constitutions. These are things that have now just become really part of the, the way of working in, in the family business world, which is great. And while this is important, what, what our work has really highlighted is that it's important to understand the family and to make sure it's aligned and so on. But there's a role that the family plays in particular that's really critical, which is making decisions as the owners of the company. And why that's so important is because in, as opposed to like the way we typically think about businesses, there's actually a hidden pyramid at the top of a family business. And so we kind of think about the regular sort of corporate pyramid. You've got the CEO at the top, you've got your managers, um, you've got your employees kind of on down. And the CEO is kind of like the epicenter of the of, of a business. Um, you may have a board of directors, oftentimes the CEO is also the chair of the board or, or helps to choose the board and so on and so forth. Um, and that's really, if you sort of look at the way that most people who study and advise companies, they're focusing on, on management uh, and how do you really run and operate a company more, more efficiently. What's important to know that that's just one way, that's what we think of as the public model, the executive's rule, the owners really aren't present very much. Maybe they occasionally you'll have an activist shareholder group that's looking for some relatively minor change in, in the board or policies or so on. But mostly if you're an owner of these business, you exercise your influence by selling the shares. And, and outside of that, you really don't have much in the way of influence over the company. And that's because of that, because ownership is so limited in a public company, um, we tend to ignore the impact of ownership on business success. And that's true, you know, I teach in a business school and for the most part, we teach management. We teach a little bit of corporate governance, but mostly we teach management um, instead, of, instead of ownership. And that's just could not be more different, that, that sort of approach of this sort of the, 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 the owners who are sort of disconnected, who, who sort of trade their shares on apps um, or who buy in, in index funds, that could not be more different uh, from the way that a family business is owned. And that's really where this other part of the pyramid comes up. That on top of that CEO, of course, you have the board, but the very top of that hierarchy are actually the owners. And when those owners are, are not um, institutions, you know, the vanguards and fidelities and so on, um, or, or, or you know, individuals you know, doing um, quick trades, day, day traders and so on, they're actual people um, who have an ability to really affect the business in some profound, in some profound ways. Um, and that's just so, so different from the way that we typically think of way about how businesses are run. And, and because of this proximity of 
own, the owners to the company, um, it brings a real power to influence the business. And, and that power can be exercised in, in lots of different ways, but really in a couple of main ones. Um, first of all, is owners have the power to destroy a business. And um, you can see a lot of these examples, there's nothing that can destroy a perfectly good business faster than the disagreement among the owners. Um, I was actually working with a family business, uh, working with the owners of it, and they said, the biggest danger to this business is us, those of us sitting around the table, because if we disagree, um, if we have a fight, um, then, then you know, that can really bring the business down faster than any other kind of disruption, maybe with the exception of something like COVID. But barring that, um, nothing can destroy a business quite, quite so fast. Um, on the other hand, family business, the owners of family businesses have this power to sustain. You can make choices. You don't have to follow the typical rules of Wall Street or anything else. Um, you can actually make decisions that allow the business to be successful over time. There are things that you can, decisions you can take, different actions you can do um, that you don't have to follow anyone else's rules. And those things can lead to the business being uh, more and more successful over time. Now, what's interesting from my vantage point is that I think that, the, especially in the public you know, sphere, the narrative really focuses on the part on the left, on, on family businesses and their, their power to destroy companies. Those, they make for great news stories um, and, and even better dramas. So those of you that have watched you know, Dallas and Dynasty over the years, now Succession on HBO, like these, these make for incredible stories about you know, these family dramatics and issues that took down these incredible, incredible businesses. Um, unfortunately, I think that, that narrative has kind of uh, you know, become a, a little bit of a misnomer. And, and in fact, especially the way that you hear it more in the family business world is this idea that you know, family businesses won't last for three generations. And um, I was talking about Paul about this before we started. I think this is one of the most unhelpful ideas that you'll find in the entire family business field. This notion that somehow family businesses are, are more fragile uh, than any other kind of companies doesn't really stand up uh, to actually looking through the data. Um, all the data I think is really telling you is that making a business last for, for decades and generations is really hard. Um, but family, there's no evidence that family businesses are somehow more fragile than other kinds of businesses. And actually, if you look around the world, you know, the, of, of the most long lasting companies, almost all of them are family owned. Um, and so I think actually this has become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where people are so focused on um, how I, I, I know as I teach in class, so many people will walk in the room and say, I'm the third generation. I'm the one that's going to blow this thing up. And that could not be you know, further from the truth. Um, so anyway, we can, we can certainly come back in the Q&A if there's interest in talking about that idea. But in fact, I think that in, in this environment, including in, in this sort of pandemic environment, the things that family businesses are good at are actually more important than they've been in a very long time. And actually family businesses have the ability to, to build sustainable competitive advantages. So going, going a little deeper into this idea of the power of ownership, why is it that owners have so much power in a business? And the reason is because owners have rights. They have the ability to do things that no one else has the right to do in the, in the family business. And these rights, when you put them together, influence basically everything, not only about the business, but about the shape and dynamics of the family and everything else. And these are the five core rights. I'll introduce them kind of briefly. Um, and then I'll kind of go through a little bit for each one and, and introduce you to some of the sort of key ideas and kind of how to, how to, uh, how to activate them. So the first thing is if you, have, if you own a business, you have the right to design it. Um, think about like if you, if you own a house, you can decide, you know, you're, and you're, you're sort of building it from scratch. How many, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how large is the yard, all those kinds of things. In a family business, you get the right to, you have the ability to design, you know, who can be an owner of the business? Who has control over the business? What do you own together? Is it just an operating company or is it that plus real estate or, you know, philanthropic, you know, foundations and other things like that? So you, oh, sorry, you have the ability to choose what type of family ownership you want. And I'll talk a little bit about what, what that means. You have the right to decide. If you own a business, you can make literally every decision about it. Everything from the strategy to the color scheme on the walls and everything in between. Now, of course, you don't necessarily want to be doing that, especially as the, the business grows. And so you have the right, therefore, to, to actually structure governance, to actually make decisions together. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
The third right that you have is the right to value. If you own a business, you basically get to keep whatever value it generates. And because of that, you can decide if there's certain things that you value more than others. Like, do you, do you value short-term performance or long-term performance? Do you value growing the business or taking money out of it? Are there certain things you won't do, um, even though they might make you more money, um, because they're against your values? Um, you also have the right to information. Um, you get, you know, other than the government in some, you know, different countries has the right to know some things. The owners can have basically a monopoly of, of information about what's going on inside the business. And you can use that uh, to actually build your communication platform or keep things private. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of impact that those choice has. Again, I'll come back to that in a second. And lastly, if you, if you own something, including a business, you have the right to decide, you know, what happens when you're done owning it? You know, do you pass it down to the next generation? If so, when and how and so on? Um, do you sell it and liquidate it and, and pass something else along or donate the proceeds to charity? You get to decide um, what happens when, when, you're, when you're done with it. And so really, as I'll come back to at the end, there's no magic. You know, if you think of the question of like, how do you make a family business that lasts across generations? There's no single thing. What it really is all about is figuring out how to activate or exercise these five rights that you have as an owner and understand how they'll influence the long-term success or failure, failure of the business. So um, let me just kind of I'll, I'll walk through them kind of one by one and kind of talk about each of these, each of these four rights. And as I said, the first one is about the right to design, basically, and thinking about there's different, we tend to think of family businesses as being kind of all the same, um, but there are actually four very different types of ways that families can, can own their companies. And we'll kind of, I'll use a, a two by two matrix to kind of show you the, the difference between them. There's a couple choices that will determine what type of family ownership you have for your business. The first is there, is there criteria to be an owner? So some family businesses basically, as long as you're, well, there's always some criteria, you have to be a descendant of the founder in most cases, um, but and sometimes, sometimes you have to be a male descendant, but the, is there, is there a, a sort of a participation expectation? So are you, know, are you inclusive of anyone who is a descendant or are you exclusive and only allowing those who are participating in the success of the business by working in it or maybe serving in the board? So are you inclusive or exclusive in that way in terms of the criteria to be the owner? And the second is, how is decision-making control shared? Is it given to everyone? So if, if there are 10 of us that own the business, do we each have 10% of the, of the control? Um, or is there one among the 10 of us who actually has all the control or two? Um, and so very different ways that family businesses are structured. And if you put those two together, what you get are, are, are four very different models. And what's interesting is that you actually can find success stories about each of them. So I'll take kind of in the bottom left hand corner, this idea of a, of a sole owner. But basically there's one person in each generation that holds all the ownership. And this is kind of going back to some of the ideas of primogenitor and kind of passing things to the eldest um, over time. Um, but it's not always that way. For example, there's a, 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 um, a cognac company called uh, Grupo Camus that's based in France. And um, in each generation, one person is, you know, it becomes the sole owner and then buys out the ownership for, that was given to their siblings and basically runs the business. And they've been doing this now for five generations. And there are lots of other family businesses that have things like that. Um, some like to, in, the, in, embedded in that is the idea that only those who are actively participating in the business really should be owners of it. Some take that same idea and basically expand it to the right and basically say, we, we want to keep this notion of family, you know, those who are active participants in the business um, being owners, uh, but extended, it can only can be more than one. And, and so, for example, there's a, a European retail company called Brennickmeyer that's, uh, sorry, called CNA, owned by the Brennickmeyer family. And there's, you know, a, a very large family, but only a subset ever become owners. And actually on their website, they talk about some of the, the process that you have to go through to even be eligible to be an owner of the company. So not every family does. Um, of course, that there are a lot of family businesses. If you look at some of the large ones with hundreds of owners, like um, Bacardi or other other companies that have a hundred or more owners, um, ownership is distributed, where you know any descendant can be an owner, and, and also control is distributed, where every all those owners have the same same access to control. So if I own one percent, then I have one percent of the voting shares. And then the last one is is what we call a concentrated um, structure where basically it's similar to the distributed that any descendant can be an owner, 
um, but a subset has has ownership control. Um, so, for example, there's a, a business called Vitamix that makes sort of high end blenders, um, and in their in their family, any any descendant of the founder can be an owner. But in each generation, the CEO actually, according to their their bylaws, has to purchase uh, the con a majority of the voting shares so that that person has the ability if there's ever they try to work towards consensus but if there's a disagreement that ceo uh, that ceo who's an owner at least so far um has that ability to break the tie um and, and there's lots of very successful family businesses that work like that so you know part of what's what's important about this is that each of these is very different the, the way the, the things they bring to the table, their strengths, their weaknesses, what they're really good at, what threats they face is, is very distinct. And so when I, whenever I'm getting to know a, a new family business, I, I try to put them at least mentally in this box because the kinds of questions that you want to understand, the kind of issues that you want to focus on are going to be very different depending on on which one it is. And, and especially as you know, benchmarking is a great thing to do. It's great to get out there and, and get to know um, other family businesses, but make sure you're benchmarking appropriately. You know, if, if you're if you're in the concentrated box where one person or a few people have all of the control, if you go and look at family businesses that operate differently, some of the governance structures and things that they use may not be very appropriate. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're kind of using that as you're kind of out in the world looking at family businesses. Um, also making sure that the, the types are aligned. Sometimes you have a difference between what the, the legal documents say and what how things actually work. So one of the family businesses that um, that, that we advise the, the legal ownership is equal, but there's, an, there's sort of like a cultural understanding that the eldest is in control. Now, of course, that works just fine until it doesn't anymore and people start to question, especially in the next, the next generation. And that's an important point is that the, the, these types can be changed in most cases. And sometimes that's the thing that actually needs to happen um, for long-term success in the family business. And I'll show you a quick example. This is sort of like, you can sometimes tell the story of a family business by understanding their evolution across some of these types. So this is a, you know, a founder business um, based here in the US, started out you know, very much with the sole owner. Um, he, was, he, was, he was in charge. Um, one of his favorite expressions is that the, the best size for a committee is an odd number less than three if you can think about what that means. So that's, he's basically said like, I'm, I'm in charge, I'm running this place. And so that's the way the business ran for a while. And then his, his, uh, his children came into the business. Um, they became owners, but he was still in charge. And so they sort of moved up into this concentrated box. He's, he's the controlling owner, but they're, they're also owners of the business. And then when he passed away and they took over, they said, well, actually, we really value this idea of owners being connected to the business. And so they created rules that only only owners that um, that were um, that were uh, working in the company and you know could actually become you know could only um, family members that working in the company could become owners, and then the third generation came in. They had to start really rethinking those rules. They kind of kept control in the second generation, um, but the third generation started to become owners on the side as well. And then the third generation basically said, you know what, this idea of you know of only having um, owners only having family members who are working in the business be owners is too restrictive our business has gotten too big for that we need to revisit that and so you can really understand this you know this idea and this evolution um, across these different types so that's that's the idea of design you know how are you structuring the ownership of the business to allow you to be successful over time um, the second one i'll talk about is this idea of you know how do you actually make decisions and there's a model that we use to kind of think about governance, we call the four room model. And the intuition is sort of just like in your house, you have you make different decisions, you have different conversations in the living room, in the kitchen, there's different types of, of work and decisions that need to happen in the family business. And there are these four main kinds. There's the, the management room where you're running the business, you're making operations decisions, you're designing strategy, you're developing people. Then you have the boardroom and the boardroom is where you're choosing who should be in the management room. Um, you're, you're sort of, you know, working on strategy, you're monitoring the business, you're approving major changes uh, to, you know, major decisions, you know, acquire a business or, or things like that. Then you have the owner room and the role of the owners is not to run the business every day, uh, but to sort of make a relatively small number of really important decisions. Are we going to stay private or go public? Are we going to dis distribute the profits out to the owners or reinvest them back in the business? Are there certain things that we're not going to do, even though they might make us more money? Those are, those are all things that happen in the, in the owner room. 
And then you have the family room. And what's important is that the family room, you know, that's the first three are a hierarchy. Management answers to the board, the board answers to the owners, um, even if they're the same people. Like you might, you might have like, you, you might be wearing you know, all the same people sitting around the table, but you might be deciding things in a very different fashion. The family room is not on top. The family room is on the side. And the reason is because the family room is the place where you build uh, family unity, you develop family talent, you, you manage family assets, whether it's a vacation home or philanthropic interest or things like that. And what you're trying to do is really to create bridges into the, into the other rooms. But one of the things that we found is that there's been some confusion overall between the difference between um, the, the family room and the owner room. Um, and family, families make decisions in a sort of very equal way, inclusive way, everyone gets a say. Whereas owner decisions, as I just said, go back to who actually controls the shares. Um, and so it's got to be made in a way that's, that's very different. And so really the work of governance um, and sort of is really building out these four rooms. What are the structures that you need um, in order to make decisions in each of those rooms? What are the, what are the processes you need to connect, the, uh, connect across them? If you're making a decision about, about dividends, what's the role of the management, the board, the owners? And uh, making sure those things are clear to avoid confusion and conflict. Um, and this is sort of just an example structure of what that can look like in a, in a family business where you've got your executive team, um, you know, you have your board of directors. Um, we oftentimes will have an owner council or a shareholder council, which is in a larger family. In a smaller family, it's all of the owners. Um, in a larger family, it's a representative group and can be both, you know, current and next generation. Um, and then you have, you have the family room activities, the family council, um, you have, you know, family meetings, family assemblies. Sometimes you have committees uh, to kind of run next generation education or family reunion. Um, and then you'll see in many, as the family gets larger, in this case, a very large family, they have a family office that helps to create some of the bridges and structures across them. So that's kind of an example of what that, what that looks like in, in a family business. And um, one of the things that we've been noticing is that in this environment, um, governance is actually very much you know, in motion. In, in many cases, the owners, where the owners had kind of stepped back from some decisions, the current environment is making them step back into it. And so we actually asked people, you know, how has the role of the owners changed in the crisis environment? And almost half said they're more involved. Very few are less involved. Some are staying the same. But in a lot of cases, decisions about things like inventory or CapEx or hiring, things that you could delegate before to your management team, um, those can become kind of you know, almost like life or death for the business decisions. If you have way too much inventory that you can't sell, um, you may not be able to, to pay, your, pay your suppliers down the road. So some evolution for sure in the way that governance is happening. So the third right is the right to value. Uh, basically decide what you want as, as the owners, owners of the business. And one thing that's, you know, is a starting point is that there are different kinds of things you can want, and really three different primary kinds of things you can want as an owner. You can want to grow the value. So we want to, just like a public company would, we want to increase the, you know, the, our shareholder returns or our total equity capital, right? And make it more valuable next year than it was this year. You can try to, you can want to take money out of the business to fund your lifestyle, your philanthropic interests or diversify on your own. Um, or you can value control, which is being able to make decisions on your own. Um, basically, if you, if you control 100% of the company, then you don't need to answer to anyone else. If you have outside you know, equity holders or outside debt holders, that's not so true. You actually have to answer to them as you make decisions. And what, what's, if you kind of think about the natural evolution is that these things actually trade off with each other. If you, wanna, if you wanna grow the business, you need capital from somewhere. And that capital can either come from reinvesting your own money and therefore not paying it out, um, or it can come from outside by borrowing from, 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 from banks or from bringing in outside equity. But in that case, you give up control. Um, and so what we found is that there's basically you know, uh, you can really focus on two of these things at the expense of the third. So you can focus on growing the business and keeping control of it. But if that's the case, um, you can't take much money out. And that's kind of this idea of this growth and control as sort of a strategy, as a way of, of navigating through what really values to you, what, what you re what, what really value. Or you can grow and take money out of the business, but you're going to do that through other people's money, through, you know, this idea of growth and liquidity. And if you do that, you're going to be giving up control to outside, you know, outside equity holders or outside debt holders. And then you can also say growth doesn't really matter to us. We want to take money out of the business and have a nice lifestyle or, or give it away. Um, but we also want to keep control. Um, you know, there's a, a family business we work with with a very a well-known um, you know, luxury brand. 
and they basically say, we don't care how big the company grows. We want it to be profitable so that we can take money out of it every year to fund our charitable pursuits. And we want to keep the culture the way it is. It basically was, a, was an art project that became a very successful business. We don't want to lose that because some other outside investor wants us to, to grow by two times um, than, you know, faster than we feel comfortable with. So those are kind of three different types of, of ways to sort of think about it. But you can, of course, pick any space in between. The important point is that as owners, you have to make these trade-offs about what you really want, what you value. And these things do trade off with each other. You can't kind of have all the same time. Um, and again, I'll tell you, a, again, a quick story kind of using um, this lens to sort of talk about the evolution of a family business. So this is a disguised but, you know, a, but real story of a, of a, of a successful uh, first generation family business. Um, on, the, on sort of the left hand chart, you'll see the, the red line is their, is their revenue. So starting up from, from zero, you know, uh, back in around 1980, uh, going a little over three million um, in terms of total revenue back into 2008. Um, and then kind of taking a big steep decline there in the housing business, which is, you know, that's, that was a reason why this went way down. Um, and then this dotted line is the, basically how much money they taken out of the company. So of the profits of the business, what percent did they take out? And, you know, as you can see for the beginning, very little, 0%. They basically just paid themselves enough to, to live. Um, and I'll tell you more about what happened, but that's where you see up to 50% and then down to about 25%. And so what happened is that, in this initial stage, like a lot of successful businesses, they adopted this kind of growth and control strategy. They grew through retained earnings, they paid zero dividends, and basically had salary-based compensation, just enough to live on, pay the bills, um, and that was kind of it. And then there was this moment where actually they decided that they wanted to um, you know, devote a lot of their, their success and what they built to charity. And because 99% of their wealth was in the business, in order to fund that, they actually had to start dividending out money every year from, from the business. And, and so that's why they went out to, they said, we want to, we want to put 50% of our, of our wealth to charity. So we have to pay out 50% of our profits of, of the business. And that's kind of what they, what they did with that, but they didn't want to stop growing the company. And so they, they used outside debt basically to keep the engine moving. Right. So they kind of switched over to that idea of growth, growth and liquidity. And then of course the, the crash, you know, economic collapse happened in 2008. Uh, really hurt their business. You, know, you could see a significant decline, and basically, they said, "Like this, you know, this has been great, um, but we really we're too we're we're too beholden to the banks. Um, they're putting you know too much pressure on our success. Um, and so, what we need to do is kind of shift to that focus on liquidity and control. So, reduce dividends, uh, but you know, pay down debt, and, and not really focus on growth for a while. We have to sort of make, gain, gain a little bit more control over the business." And we'll kind of use our existing platform to grow. And you can see the growth rate of the business really was still good, but not nearly as steep as some of the curves that they had before when they were really using some more outside money to grow. So, and you can see these trade-offs happening in, in family businesses right now. And one of the things we asked in the survey was, what are the things that people are, are doing to survive? And you could, they, they could choose more than one, which is why you see it adds to well more than, well more than 100 things. Um, but one of the things that we heard consistently through the survey and, and through our clients is that, you know, right now cash is king. You know, you, we want to basically in this kind of an environment, get your balance sheet, get your cash position as, as strong as you possibly can. Um, and, and what we found is that 90% of the respondents are, are using at least one of these tools to reduce cash, to conserve cash. They're either reducing expenses, they're delaying capital investment, or they're reducing dividends. And, and almost a quarter are using all three of those things as ways to navigate, navigate through this crisis. Interestingly, what most are not doing is, is sort of giving up control, except when they need to. So very few are bringing in new capital from, from outside owners or selling part of the business. Most of them are choosing to slow down growth or reduce liquidity rather than give up control. And, and that's part of the nature of being in a family business. You can do that. You can make those choices to say, yeah, we're just gonna make a little bit less money this year, um, but in the long term, we're gonna preserve our ability to influence and control the business. And as you're doing that, one of the things that's really valuable as you're setting up your, your owner strategy is to sort of think about what are your guardrails? How are you going to measure success? How do you translate these goals that I've talked about into concrete ways of understanding how your business is doing? Just like when you're driving on a mountain pass, the guardrails are the things that keep you from going, going out of bounds. Um, and those guardrails sometimes are financial things. And you'll see family business, you know, owners of businesses say, we want a minimum return on invested capital of X percent 
or we want a maximum uh, debt to EBITDA of Y percent. And you can kind of set a few number of financial guardrails that really help define uh, for those running the business what success means and what you don't want. And then you can have non-financial guardrails. These are things that you sort of say they're off the table, even if they can make us more money. So there's a, a chemical business that we that we work with, and they um, could they have they had some opportunities to supply the, the um, cigarette manufacturing industry, and basically said, we don't want to do that, even though it can make us a lot of money uh, because it's against our values. And, and that's something that really the the owners that's in their purview to make those kinds of decisions. Okay, so uh, we're on four, four, four of the five rights. We're now on the inform, you know, information one. Um, what's interesting I find is that, you know, we always talk about how important communication is in the family business. And I agree. And, and one of the reasons why communication is so important is because it helps you to create capital. So as I mentioned to you, as an owner, you know, you have the, the owners have the ability to basically decide what, what information flows to all of your different audiences, the current owners, the next generation. Do you tell them what's going on or not going on? Are spouses involved and engaged? Are they kind of off to the side? Um, you know, some family businesses are very open with employees about how they're doing. Others are very closed. Um, some are very public about, you know, we're a family company. We brand ourselves as that. Others, you have no idea that, you know, how big they are um, unless you were kind of, you happen to, to know them well. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, communication is actually really critical in created trusting, trusted relationships. And, and sometimes I find that trust is, some, when people talk about trust, they use it as, uh, actually, it's kind of like a four-letter word in a family business. If you say you don't trust someone, that's almost the worst thing you can say in a family business. But we tend to treat trust as something that you either have or you don't. But in reality, trust is actually more like a bank account. Every interaction that you have with someone through your behaviors, you're, act, you're either adding to the account um, or you're subtracting from the account. And the way that you do that is by, you know, this is sort of a framework that we found to be really helpful. You know, trust is built when you're transparent, when you're open, when you demonstrate competence, that you're actually good at what you're doing, um, that you show concern for other people, not just for yourself, and when you're reliable, that you do the things that you're supposed to do. And what's interesting is that communication, the reason why communication is so critical is that it's basically critical to is essential to all of those things, right? To be transparent, you can be you can be really confident, but if no one knows it because you're not telling them, um, then then you know how are they ever going to build that trust with you? How can you show concern without communication? How can you show you're reliable if you're not communicating your expectations and, and your behaviors and so on? And what's what's so important about these trusted relationships is that they actually allow you to build the kind of capital that family businesses need to succeed because you are at a disadvantage as a family business, not having access to public markets and all those kinds of things. Um, but you're, if you actually build these trusted relationships, you can create you know, strong financial capital, patient owners, people that are willing to live through the, the ups and downs of the business cycle. You can create engaged employees, which by the way, is what everyone's looking for. There's this huge global understanding that employees are not as engaged as they should be. Um, and, and trust helps to build that. You can create social capital by the reputation that you have. Uh, Edelman does a study on um, you know, trust every year. And what they find is that family businesses are more trusted. But if people don't know you're a family business, um, then how do you actually build up that level of trust? Um, and what's interesting is that communication, of course, is changing during this pandemic. Uh, most people are, are, are communicating more frequently. We actually didn't need the 30, we just wrote in. Yes, we're using virtual technology more. Uh, more, more regular communication with employees. Um, you can see the bottom two comments, the importance of honesty and transparency. Um, you, know, you, you don't want to be lying, you know, lying to people, but you also want the last point, keeping a positive attitude about what's going on in the business, kind of portraying your confidence in, in the future. Um, I'll skip that. The, the last right that we'll talk about is the importance of, of, tra of to transfer and transition. And, and really, so people tend to focus on, well, if I just choose that one leader, then I've succeeded. But in reality, a, tra a good transition plan needs to actually ask three different questions. How are you gonna pass the assets? You know, how are the assets gonna go from one generation to the next in the most tax efficient and sort of you know, way that's aligned with your, with your ownership type? Um, how are you gonna pass down roles? Not just the, the, the sort of the CEO role, but also leadership roles in the family across those four rooms. Um, that we talked about. And then how are you going to develop capabilities? How are you going to, how are you going to develop family talent, um, both the individuals in your family, but also as a group? How do you build those communication skills that are going to need to be successful? And all three of these are actually 
critical to making that transition plan work across generations. And in all three of them, we're seeing some really big changes happening because of, uh, of COVID. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the silver linings is that if the value of your business has gone down in the last six months, um, this might be a great time to accelerate some of those S asset transition plans. And we see a lot of family businesses exploring that. Um, it's, it's disrupting a lot of plans on, on leadership transitions. Some people are, you know, either we're planning to retire and postpone that, um, or some, some of them are actually accelerating um, that, that sort of departure and saying the next generation is much better at the, the e-commerce strategy that we need. I need to step back and, and give them some room. Or they're just realizing that some of the leadership, the continuity plans and succession plans, um, it's, you know, made, made them realize how important those are in this, in this time period. And of course, a lot of family businesses are using this as a great opportunity to develop the next generation. They're, they're basically using this as a, a laboratory to say, you know, we'll make it through this crisis. And this is a really valuable opportunity for you all to learn about how to navigate a crisis because these hopefully don't come along very often. And, and so how do you really engage the next generation in that process of learning? So I, I want to just go back to the beginning and talk about what does it mean to be successful? Well, what, what it doesn't mean is there's no silver bullet out there. Um, in fact, there are very few things that I would consider to be best practices in the sense that everyone should do them. And in particular, sometimes I hear, well, we just need a family constitution or a family protocol. That's not going to do the trick. Um, it's in some, if you don't really do the work to figure out what's behind it, if you just go away for a weekend and have some consultant write you a family constitution, it's not going to be worth the paper it's printed on. Um, instead, you know, what this is about is really figuring out how to exercise these five rights. How you do those things that we've just talked about is really what determines the long-term success or failure of the business and also shapes what happens in the family. And what's important is not, not what's right or wrong or what some other family business does. It's are you aligned? Do you agree that how we make decisions works for us? Is your family employment policy, you know, it doesn't have to be what someone else does, but does it work for you all? Are you agree that, that, that that's gonna be, you know, be successful? And recognizing that, th that this has to change. What worked brilliantly in one generation may cause a downfall the next. You have to revisit each of these five rights during times of change and even during a time of crisis. How you were, how you're running the business, you know, six months ago may not be how you need to run it, run it today. And that kind of gets to the last, last point I want to make, which is that successful family businesses, you know, it, it, part of it is not about, there's, there's lots of things you can do, governance and all that kind of stuff I've talked about. So much of it though comes down to culture and really are you developing the kind of traits um, across your family, they're going to help you be successful. And these are the ones that we found to be most critical. Are you curious? You know, is, is, your, is your family business full of learners? It doesn't mean that you went to the best schools. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Some of the best learners that, that I know never graduated high school. Uh, but they want to know, they want to understand, they don't think they have a monopoly of knowledge on everything that's going on in the family business. Are you, are you curious about how, how, you're, how things work, how others are doing it? Are you willing to do the work? Because, there, because there's no silver bullet, you know, this requires effort, not just running the business, but all this other stuff on governance and developing your owner strategy and guardrails and think, thinking about your communication policy. All of it involves work and it involves work together. So can you actually, are you willing to sort of you know, sit around a table uh, and actually roll up your sleeves and, and do that work that's required? Um, and are you open to change? Because so much of this is about, you know, what worked in one generation may not work in the next. Um, you have to be open. Uh, to sort of making, you know, to sort of changing things as, as the circumstances change. And, and so a lot of the success or failure is in how are you developing and incul inculcating, driving these kinds of behaviors. Because once you, if you do those things, then you can figure out the rest. None of this is rocket science. Like it's all doable. It's all in front of you. The, the, you know, there's a lot that's known about what makes family business succeed if you're willing to actually put the time and energy into it. Um, and with that, I think I've probably gone a little over time, but I'll stop there and, and uh, would welcome questions, comments, and any discussion. It's always great working with an academic or someone that teaches to class times because you, you've just stuck to time beautifully there, Josh, to be fair. Um, a fantastic insight, I think, into some of the, the things that you're seeing. I, I, you, you mentioned four rooms and the four rooms that you see as the important four rooms to define strategy and help families move yeah. forward. Do you think yeah. that one room in particular gives a family more chance of, of preparing to succeed? Or are there, it just, does it vary from family to family? So um, I think what's important is that, you know, like, you know, the, a family business is, is, of course, you know, a system in the sense that everything is connected, right? And so, you know, if, if you're, what, what you'll find is that if one room is missing, then the whole structure tends not to work very well. 
Um, I'll give you an example. Like work, I've worked with a number of family businesses that have, you know, very, very successful, large, multi-billion dollar companies. Um, and, and they've been to lots of family business programs and conferences. And so what they've done is they have, they have an outstanding management team. Um, they've got a high class board of directors with independent, you know, independent members. Um, they've got their family council. And what they're finding is that they're missing the owner room um, because that's the one that probably has been least discussed um, over the time, you know, over, over this, you know, over this development of the field. And so what happens is the board of directors sitting there saying, you know, tell us what you want. Do you want us to grow this business? Do you want us to diversify it? Do you want us to take a lot of risk or a little risk? Do you want to take money out of it? Do you want to reinvest it? We'll do anything you want, but just tell us. And the family council tries to step in, but the family council is composed of, you know, everyone it's got, you know, and everyone's got a single vote and, and it's incapable of kind of stepping into that role. Yeah. Um, so I guess the answer to your question, Paul, is that the one that we see most missing is the owner room. And in fact, most of the work that my colleagues and I do is in helping family businesses to build up, to restructure and create the owner room um, because that's the one that has been, has been least developed. But all of them serve a role. And by the way, as I said, it doesn't mean that you need to have this very, if you have a relatively small family, it doesn't mean you need this really complicated governance structure or you know, work with one family of, of, uh, of six siblings and they basically had lunch together every day and, and their conversations basically went to everything from, you know, are we gonna buy this machine to where are we going on family vacation to, you know, what should we do with the profits? Should we pay out dividend? Like, and everything in between. And, and what we did was basically say, that's, you know, great the six of you meet so often, but let's structure those. Like, let's have one, one time you're talking about management issues and you should actually invite your senior non-family managers in the room. Let's have board, you know, a meeting for board time, you know, where you're actually discussing board issues and you have an agenda and a structure and maybe you should look to add some independent members have your owner room, have your family room. And by the way, in that room, you should invite the spouses to come in, your next generation. So it doesn't have to be this really complicated structure, but I'd really encourage folks to, um, to really think about how you develop, you know, how you're having each of those conversations. And maybe it's as much as just we're switching, we're, we're, we're taking our hat off, we're taking, you know, we're, we're meeting for two hours and the first hour we're gonna wear our family hat and the second hour we're gonna wear our owner hat. Um, and, and really thinking about how we make decisions differently. Yeah. That's really, I mean, that's really good advice. And it sounds obvious when you say it, but I know that when you're involved in a day-to-day, -day, I guess, day-to-day -day business operations, and then you take time out and go into the boardroom, and it's very difficult to just step back and think like that, isn't it? Um, yeah, One, one sure. of the other things I think this year, um, Josh, that we've seen a lot of, in the, especially in the last six months, is you talk about bringing them together in those different rooms to explore and, and talk openly and have open co and honest conversations. Um, I've had a lot of conversations in the last two weeks in particular with next gen saying actually we haven't got as much of a voice and we, we're struggling to get yeah. our voices heard what advice would you have to the next gen out there that are, that are looking to try and they've got some great advice some great ideas some digital ideas ways to take it forward but they're not being heard how do those conversations how can they happen better yeah it's a, it's a great one and this is one that you know because i you know teach in an mba program i would say this is something that you know, almost all of the students that I have that come from family business and they go back, this is, this is a, a real challenge that they're facing because you know, think about this, you've, got, you've just spent 18 months or two years getting a world-class business education, maybe done an internship, you know, you've got this, all this sort of like, I have all these amazing ideas, right? And that's true, right? And then you come back and you, and you kind of say, well, you know, why is no one listening to me? Um, so, I think, I think a couple, so first of all, it's, it's hard, you know, to say like, it's a challenge. Um, a, a few pieces of advice that, 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 that I would offer. One is that is try to put yourself in the receiver's position rather than your position and, and sort of try to understand if it's your, if it's your father or uncle or aunt or, or sibling, whoever it is, um, how do they process information? Um, and, and, and sort of say some, some people like re are really, you know, they like to read. And you could even, you know, you know, I said some of them maybe never graduated high school, but they read books and articles all the time. They're really up on stuff. Maybe send them, send them something to read, something, something that really, you know, a case study from your, from your class or, or maybe some article that you found really fascinating and say, would love to talk about this. Um, you know, some it's, it's more a, a conversation and dialogue and, and some it's more of a formal setting at business or some you can kind of catch them in sort of those off moments, you know, on a, on a weekend or whatever. So, First of all, is just sort of trying to sort of put yourself in that position and say, how is this per how is this person that I'm trying to influence, um, you know, going to best receive uh, this this advice? 
Um, a second thing is that one of the, one of the one of the idea one of the concepts I think has been and has been proven to be really useful in this whole question of how do ideas spread, how do people internalize things, is the idea of grafting. You know, just like when you're when you're having you know a transplant, you know, you don't want the you don't want the host to sort of reject the the you know the, the new the new the new tissue material. Um, you, the, a way to do this is to try to say, you know, how how do I make this new idea sound less new and revolutionary and more incremental and evolutionary? Um, and, and basically, sometimes you can do that by saying, you know, look, this is just another step in what we've already been doing. Or you can harken back to the values of, of that people and say, you know, um, aunt, you've always you've always been super entrepreneurial, innovative. And, and I'm just trying to follow in your footsteps. And so to the extent that you can take your, your new big new idea um, and, and make it feel like it's actually connected to something they already believe in, I think your odds go way up. Um, and um, I think the, the, the um, let me see if there's uh, one more piece. Um, oh, here's what it was. The last piece of advice I would give is to start, um, start small and build up your competence. And so the, the, I actually, I led a panel at Columbia a couple of years ago of this next gen group that were amazing. Uh, it's sort of coming into a business and, and building up their, you know, their, they, they now reach the leadership spot, but they'd gotten there not all at once, but in increments. And they basically said, I'm first going to come in and show and demonstrate not just to the family, but to these non-family, key non-family employees that I'm really good at this specific, solving this particular problem. And then I'm going to use that platform to go a little higher. And then I'm going to build that a little higher. So you're kind of, you're building your coalition, you're building your, your, your level of buy and expertise. Um, and sort of through that, you can actually get to those big things by making sort of some, some smaller wins along the way. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, a couple of questions coming in from the floor, actually. The first one, um, with owners getting more involved in the current circumstances, um, are you seeing more or less discussion about, or in the family firm, about whether um, the long-term succession will be the business of the next generation, so the transition of the business or sell the business to the next generation? Is that on the agenda more? Um, you know, I think there's a little bit of that, um, especially if, I, I think if it's in particular because this crisis has amplified or highlighted some things that were already there and in motion. So I, I think for those businesses that were saying, you know, we were kind of, you know, either our business is, you know, was kind of struggling before and now it's really struggling. And so maybe we're, we're best off trying to, to ca you know, to, to cash out um, and get the most value that we can. Or, um, you know, we've been putting off this whole succession idea and, and we just realized that, you know, we need to accelerate it. Maybe we've, we've this, the, the pandemic has really highlighted the, the mortality and vulnerability of some of our you know, senior generation members. Um, and, and no one really wants to step up either in running the business or even in serving on the board or anything like that. So I, I think that it, mostly in those circumstances, so I think it is kind of highlighting that. I'm, I'm at least not seeing a mass you know, run, for the, run for the exits kind of thing where people are really looking for the mo you know, in, in large numbers to, to exit. I think um, in, some, in, in many families, I would say it, it, it's had the opposite effect of it's really kind of said, you know, we really value this this business, and we value it because of all the employees that depend and whose lives depend on it, or our customers who really benefit from it. Um, and, and we're really more committed than ever to try to save it. That means that we need to change some things that we otherwise wouldn't have changed. So, I, I think that's more, Paul. I think it's more those that have it, it probably tipped. It's tipped the scales for a few, mm -hmm. um, but I think for for the most part, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of of major sort of realizations and. I mean, the thing is, most family businesses have been, maybe not one quite this immediate or as intense, but most have been through these crises, like the example I showed of the housing crisis. I mean, that killed businesses back in, back in 08. You know, a lot, of, you know, a lot of businesses suffered, or they'll all tell you their stories uh, of things that they've been through. And a lot of them just say, well, you know, we're, well, this is, this is bad. Maybe it's never been this bad before, but um, we've been through bad before and, and we'll make it through it. We'll make it through it again. And, and you, I think you're right, Josh, and you look at the oldest family firms that are 26, 27 generations old and, and older. Yeah. They've, been through, they've been through a lot of other big challenges through world wars and the Industrial Revolution, the birth For of the sure. and all sorts of other stuff. So they have come through it. And I think some of your, your, your stories early on in terms of 
recognizing that it's not rags to riches and i know it's a phrase we don't like using but rags to riches in three generations there are lots yeah. of businesses out there that have passed through a lot longer generations and made it past that statistic and and they should be applauded um another question i need to read to you actually because it's quite a long one um okay it's obviously an advisor we're seeing a lot of conflict starting to rise between generations in family firms principally as the older generations lose their authority through reluctance fear of change technology um and unwilling to let the next generation take the lead either through lack of experience or because of the fact that, that the escalation of change at the moment um through covid and obviously in the uk we've got brexit on the horizon too and the, the challenges sure. with brexit so any tips on helping them deal with the situation in terms of trying to make sure that the generations stay together yeah that's that's these are i, I think these are some of the the really the toughest most complicated most challenging issues is is when you kind of have this you know i think there's this idea of generational transition that, that is sort of described as well you know we've got one generation running it the next generation comes in and there's this great passing of the baton and you know and in re <laughs> the, re the reality kind of um, kind of rarely works like that um I, I, a few kind of things i would suggest is is one is um is sort of focusing on the the, the senior generation first because i think there's you can work this you can work this really in both sides um one way is to really help the senior generation think about what's next um and, and sort of what are they you know if you're trying it's really hard to get someone especially someone that's been in a, a position of power and influence for their entire life uh to get them just to step off of that and, and sort of go on and just sort of become a civilian or whatever right to, just to kind of come come all the way off that it really requires a, a process of thinking about what's the place to land and, and can you actually help those those folks that are in that position now to find some some like good place to land and maybe that's sort of having some outside interests where they're you know whether it's giving back to the community or whatever um, or, or maybe it's actually trying to find a role where they still feel valued you know i work with um, one family business with one of these you know uh, highly engaged operational kind of people and what they did was they actually they said so that you're, you're still going to be involved in two things one is whenever we have a big transit transaction you're going to come in and give us your perspective because you're as good as anyone in our industry on that particular thing. That's what you're really passionate about. We're gonna bring you in on that. The second thing is we're gonna put you to work in helping to train some of our next generation managers, family and non-family, because you've got something, you really understand this field. We're gonna engage you in that. So one aspect of this for the senior generation is to sort of say, um, you know, what is it that we can, you can help them to find, to find a role that feels valuable valued that you know they're, they're giving up their identity here how do you keep some part of it while getting them out of the way of some of the decisions that they're probably less comfortable with less effective with so i think that's the one side of the equation the other side is for the the next generation one thing that you know we've done a number of times is basically working backwards which is basically to say um we know just sort of start the conversation and say we're not going to change anything right now Right. We know that you're you're we don't want to sort of cross those lines. We're going to hold put a pause on that. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out with your guidance, senior generation, but we're going to figure out as the next generation how we're going to run things when it's our turn. Right. And we're going to say, here's how we're going to do it. Here's how it's going to be different. We're going to work in governance this way. We're going to change the business in this way and, and those kinds of things. Um, and what I what I found is that that's you know an imperfect solution. Ideally, ideally you want this to be a cross generational give and take, but sometimes you just you can't do that. What that does is two things. First of all, it really helps the next generation to get aligned, so that when it is their turn, which can come sooner than you think, you're actually ready to go. It's like you can break glass, ready to go. Here's how we're going to work together. Here's how we're going to make decisions. Here's the changes we're going to make to the business, and so on. The second thing is oftentimes what the senior generation is fearful about is the next generation not being aligned and being in conflict with each other and feeling like I've got to save them. And so sometimes if they if they see that alignment, if they see a clear path and they also see that everyone but me wants this new thing, maybe I'll start to be willing to take some steps in that direction. I've actually seen this play out in, in real time. So I would sort of those are a couple. There's lots of this is a, a long, a longer conversation. Those are a couple of things that I would I would highlight. You, you touched on something i've interviewed quite a few um family business owners over the last two weeks and actually passing on skills from the older generation there's one who's a um a very senior 80 year old um glass blower who's based in scotland and is now documenting through digital technology how to blow glass to actually teach the next generation of, of employees wow. which is fascinating and That's another so one where the, the, the chairman stepped back and has kind of become 
I'm going to use the word presidential, but he, he he's not hands on. He, but he's there. But they're documenting their 223 year history, and he's writing books, and he's engaging with the next generation and the communities. So he's kind of out there, and he's found a he's found a new role, which has kind of given him a new a new lease of life, which is fantastic to see. But it's also I think fantastic. we often talk about the the generational transition and difference between the older and younger generation. But there's a lot of younger generations out there that I think don't get their voice heard in terms of they're very supportive of what the, the first and second generation have done and yeah. don't want to throw the throw them out of the bathwater just to take control. They want to embrace yeah. that story. Um, and the other thing I said, I guess I'm seeing is a lot of the next gen, maybe the third generation, fourth generation are doing more digitally to tell the story and share those values and the history and the culture. And that's one way to show they're committed, I guess, in terms of what they're doing and, and really pulling on the older generations too. So it, it does work both ways, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's sort of, there, there's no, there, this is, as I said, this is a hard one. I think to the extent that you can, as you said, find things to go to, as opposed to just leave from, um, I think your odd, your odds go up. And, and I think to the extent that you can, as you, as you mentioned, communicate your commitment as individuals and as a group and your level of alignment and support of them, um, you know, your odds, your odds also go up. And I think to think sometimes you can, again, going back to things I said earlier about sort of how you communicate, oftentimes in family businesses, oftentimes it's so much more important how you do things than what you do. And if you can communicate in a way that shows respect, um, that connects to that person's values and interests and in the way that they like to hear things, um, your odds of being able to break through some of these tough dynamics also go way up. Yeah I, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think the only other thing I'd throw, throw in the mix is that, okay, at the moment we can't go to in-person events, but actually if you can take two generations or more to an event and listen to other families talking about what they've been through, then there are sometimes yeah. like moments which we've all seen and they're really powerful. For sure. I've seen, that's a great point, Paul. And I've seen, I've seen that play out so much that you kind of just, just, as I said, get someone, you know, involved, whether it's, you know, some, some people said a case study, some they really like to hear other stories. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that really pay off pay off well when you can sort of see someone see it's really sometimes hard to be analytical about your own situation because you're so personally embedded in it that's one of the reasons why case you know case examples are so valuable either reading them or, or going and, and hearing about them and so if you if you can get that kind of an experience um it can it can really make a difference yeah and I, I guess the whole coronavirus pandemic has already kind of brought some of those 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 frailties and some of those conversations to the fore whereas others have just kind of put them to the side because they've got to fight and survive the business has to survive first and foremost so it's it's, di sure. it's different from for families all over the over the world and and, and culture comes into it too 100 percent. yeah absolutely josh as always um you have given us lots and lots of food for thought um for anyone interested you mentioned the book which we will share the details of how they can access the book um later on the articles that you referred to are actually already on fbu and we've shared the playlist before um and Great. i will make sure that we share the the research questionnaire with our with our audience to try and get some more uk and and, and international responses for your survey so josh Sounds you fantastic. are fantastic Doing a, doing a great job. It's, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for supporting the summit and supporting the, 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 our, our endeavours really to support family businesses the world over and um, keep safe and well. It's been a pleasure. You too, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Take care.